Hi, it's Kristen here at UT Southwestern Medical Center. Thank you for joining us for our latest Facebook Live chat. Today we're going to be chatting with Dr. Carlos Bagley about spine health. So Dr. Bagley is Vice Chair of Neurological Surgery here at UT Southwestern and he leads the Multidisciplinary Spine Clinic. He also has an appointment in orthopedic surgery, so we're very excited to have Dr. Bagley. Before we get started, don't forget to like and share the conversation. If you start having audio issues, you might just try refreshing your browser or pumping up the audio on your machine. Also, um, make sure you leave your questions in the comments section of your feed, and we will take as many as we can get to in the next 30 minutes. So thank you for joining us, Dr. Bagley. Yes, ma'am. It's nice to be here. Um, but to start, what are some, some tips for people just in general to maintain a healthy spine? What do they need to take into consideration? Well, I think there's, um, it, it's multifactorial. Um, obviously, uh, activity and being fit is mm -hmm. very important to keep an eye, a, a healthy spine. Mm -hmm. um, and also, uh, folks forget that it, often the daily things that we do, the daily wear and tear actually contribute significantly to mm -hmm. Um, back problems and so things that um, that we do routinely like bending improperly okay. uh, lifting things that we know we shouldn't lift um, things like that they ultimately uh, catch up with us um, at the okay. time um, we don't uh, we don't realize the damage that we're doing but it, uh, those are the sort of things that on a daily basis um, can really help prevent uh, issues on down the road and uh, again staying fit staying active mm -hmm. is um, absolutely critical so there is, is there a certain type of fitness activity that's good for your back or for your spine? Um, core strengthening is, is kind of a centerpiece of all that we recommend for spine mm -hmm. care, um, but just fitness in general. Um, okay. Folks will often uh, talk about things like weight loss, and weight loss okay. is often uh, very beneficial, and it doesn't have to be 100 pounds of weight loss. Um, it can be as small as 5 or 10 pounds. Uh, really? can make a big difference to um, to your spine because your spine is carrying that weight around all day. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you're able to alleviate just a little bit of load, it can sometimes do wonders for, uh, for backache and things like that. Okay, that is good to know. So one of the things that you know we wanted to, to talk about was now here we have a multidisciplinary spine clinic yes, that, that you lead. I mean what is what is unique about that program and what what do you offer that maybe other centers wouldn't? Well I think spine is one of the areas where it's a it's an intersection of multiple disciplines. Yes. Um, it's uh, it's hard to think of a discipline that doesn't uh, intersect with spine. Uh, you have anywhere from primary care, orthopedics, neurosurgery, uh, uh, rehab medicine, uh, chiropractic care, mm -hmm. um, the list goes on and on. And um, for patients, uh, just the sheer number of choices can be very, very daunting uh, mm -hmm. regarding where you seek uh, care and at what point in your um, in your in the process of your back problem. Gotcha. Um, and so having a multidisciplinary approach, it does two things. One, it takes the guesswork out of it for the patient. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, we have. Uh, what we consider a fairly robust set of skill sets on hand. Mm -hmm. So regardless of what it is that you need, we hopefully have it uh, in-house. Okay. Um, I know as a neurosurgeon, I have, um, you know, by definition, I have a limited set of skills, although, right. um, you know, we, we do some pretty amazing things, but I'm not a physiatrist. I don't do injections and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so having a well-rounded team, it allows us to, to treat patients in a more comprehensive manner. Okay. And it also uh, affords us more uh, diverse perspectives on care mm -hmm. um, so that you're not biased by your training. Because as a neurosurgeon, as an orthopedic surgeon, as a uh, physical therapist, mm -hmm. you're trained in one uh, discipline. And so having those uh, th that, um, that broad thought process uh, mm -hmm. coming together at the same time for patients, I think, is very beneficial. Okay. All right. Yeah, well, we're starting to get some questions in, but I wanted to ask you, as related to that, so it sounds like, you know, if you were to come to a spine center, surgery isn't the only option. There could be other methods that could address your needs. Um, absolutely. Um, and fortunately, surgery is only warranted, particularly for back pain, uh, in about 5% of patients. Um, okay. And so the vast majority of patients don't need me as a neurosurgeon. Mm -hmm. um, they need my colleagues in physical therapy or rehab medicine okay. uh, or in anesthesiology or interventional anesthesiologists. And so um, I think one thing that is very important to understand is that surgery is one, uh, typically the last resort for most conditions mm -hmm. um, and only appropriate for a very small percentage of patients overall. Gotcha, okay. So let's get some of these questions here. So one of them came through from Lori, 
and she says, do you recommend yoga to your parent patients? If he gets to that, maybe core strength. Uh, I, I think yoga, in terms of uh, kind of very popular types of exercise, um, yoga and Pilates are excellent for okay. uh, for folks with back uh, issues. Mm -hmm. um, often, uh, patients as a surgeon, uh, as patients recuperate and and move into the uh, kind of post acute phase of their uh, their recovery, right. um, that's often the form of exercise that I will encourage patients to get into because okay. uh, it's really good for the back. It, uh, it stresses core strengthening and flexibility, mm -hmm. um, which is very good for uh, for back health. Very good. It's a really good question, Lori. So you know, like along that same line, you know, what who? Let's see. They they've done a lot of different things. Who is a good candidate for surgery? I mean, when does when does that come into play? Well, again, for most conditions, uh, surgery is the last resort when um, when a non-operative course of, of treatment has failed. Mm -hmm. um, there are certain conditions where the threat to neurologic function or uh, bodily function is so great. That surgery may be more in the forefront, but right. um, but as a general rule of thumb, uh, surgery is when all other measures have been exhausted, and okay. um, those are things from uh, just uh, activity modification, um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, uh, injected anti-inflammatories, um, and uh, rehabilitation, so uh, okay. physical therapy, which is again kind of a linchpin of, of uh, right. care for spine. Okay. So are there things? Oh, that's one end. The, the other end, are there things that people can do at home if they're experiencing back pain? Uh, absolutely. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's always the old adage, if it hurts, don't do it. So obviously avoiding things that, <laughs> uh, that uh, led to the problem in the first place right. uh, can be very beneficial. Okay. Um, things like uh, heat and ice to, uh, for the musculoskeletal component of pain, mm -hmm. uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories when they're not contraindicated mm -hmm. uh, can okay. be very beneficial. Okay. Um, and if those things aren't working, then uh, it may be uh, time to, to seek the advice of a professional but more often than not, those things will uh, will alleviate the symptoms um, upwards of 80, 90% of patients. Okay, that's good to know. So get back to, to we've got another question in here. This one is, what is spinal stenosis? So, Any more treatment specific, or condition specific? Yes, ma'am. So spinal stenosis is where there's narrowing of the spinal column. Um, okay. Within the spinal column, um, really there should only be two things, or three things really. Uh, the coverings around the spinal right. cord. We should use pull this over. If this helps. Yes, ma'am. So, um, so typically within uh, within the spinal column, um, there's the uh, the vertebrae that protects it mm -hmm. within the, the the canal. However, there's just the covering around the spinal cord, the spinal cord itself, and cerebral spinal fluid. Okay. Um, so, spinal stenosis is when other structures start to encroach on that, and sometimes that can be disc. Um, sometimes it can be bone spurs, mm -hmm. uh, it can be arthritic changes in the ligaments that underlie the, the okay. bone there. Um, and so the space for the nerves or spinal cord become more and more narrowed. Um, you can get compression and various symptoms depending on the level. Uh, anywhere from numbness and tingling, oh, pain, okay. uh, sciatica is a, is a common um, result of, uh, of spinal stenosis or uh, difficulty walking, uh, heaviness right. in the legs, things of that sort. Okay, okay. Really good question there. So hold on to that. We got another one that was related. They wanted to ask, mm -hmm. you know, what about? Um, I had it written. This one came in beforehand. They said, what about degenerative disc disease? Different. What happens there, and is mm -hmm. that something that? I mean, how would you treat that? So, um, so degenerative disc disease in and of itself, um, I think calling it a disease is a little bit of a misnomer mm -hmm. um, because it is a, a part of what we'd consider the natural aging process, and okay. so. Um, Sometimes, because a disc degenerates, it doesn't. It's not necessarily problematic. Again, mm -hmm. it's it's normal aging. It's only in, uh, in circumstances where it causes uh, compromise of the spinal integrity, where the spinal uh, column becomes misaligned or okay. uh, unstable, um, okay. or there's impingement on the nerve roots, the spinal cord, and things like that. Um, so, disc degeneration in and of itself. Um, isn't always a, um, a very problematic thing. It can be uh, a surrogate of, of uh, folks that have pain. So gotcha. uh, the usual treatments, uh, physical therapy, uh, weight loss, core strengthening, okay. uh, and sometimes anti-inflammatories and things of that nature work very well to address symptoms that can be associated with those findings on, on imaging studies. Okay, really good question. So thank you all for all of the questions that are coming in. Keep them coming. We have about 20 minutes left, so keep those questions going. What about, now I know you do a lot of work with, with tumors, spinal yes, tumors. I mean, how are those diagnosed? Mm -hmm. What, how, how common are they? 
Um, so fortunately, they're very uncommon. Um, they're, sometimes it can be based on the medical history. Um, the most common types of tumors that we treat surgically are tumors that have spread from other parts of the body. Okay. Um, so uh, things like breast cancer, prostate cancer. Um, here at UT Southwestern, we uh, see a number of patients with renal cell carcinoma that spread to the spinal column. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the most common things, but then you can also have tumors that arise primarily in the spinal cord mm -hmm. um, or the structures around it. Um, spinal cord tumors um, can present very nonspecifically, uh, right. sometimes just with pain in the area of the uh, symptoms. Okay. Um, but usually, uh, particularly when it's a spinal cord tumor, it tends to be very insidious in onset and they... Mm -hmm. um, the clinical symptoms can sometimes go on for a very prolonged period of time before they reach a threshold that it, it prompts a workup to uh, to discover it. Okay. Um, so in patients with without the medical history, sometimes the diagnosis can be uh, can be very very difficult. Right, that's what it sounds like. So we have a question from a Mandy and Mandy Brill. She says, "What is involved with a spinal fusion?" So uh, spinal fusion, um, it. Sounds it, very trendy. <laughs> um, it's often uh, utilized when there's uh, when there's instability of the spine for okay. uh, for various reasons, or uh, in cases where there are uh, the surgical treatment destabilizes the spine. So okay. uh, things like a spinal lolisthesis that's unstable, uh, sometimes spinal deformity like scoliosis mm -hmm. um, uh, can require a fusion, and then sometimes uh, again because of what we have to do in order to address the issue, we have to fuse the spine in order to uh, stabilize it because we've destabilized it by addressing the underlying problem. Okay, so does that mean that you literally, like on this here, that you literally fuse two pieces together? Yes, ma'am. So there's there are multiple different ways of doing it. Um, this uh, here is an illustration of what's called pedicle screws, and so okay. this is a common way that we fuse the spine uh, posteriorly or from mm -hmm. the back. Um, we also sometimes uh, do anterior or uh, purchase from the front of the spine. Okay. Um, and this is a lateral plate that we would use uh, for a case similar to that. Okay. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that we go about doing it. Um, and fortunately, as um, surgical techniques have advanced, right. it's allowed us to treat a number of things very safely mm -hmm. um, and very efficiently that um, even just a few years ago, we, we really were uh, limited in what we could treat. Right, but that's one of the things that you do a lot of, a lot of minimally invasive spine surgery. Because what are the latest developments in that area? Well, minimally invasive spine surgery is something that really over the past decade or so has undergone a, a tremendous explosion in, in, mm -hmm. uh, in availability and also the things that can be treated. Um, anything from spinal deformity to herniated disc and sciatica can be treated with minimally invasive techniques. Right. Um, and our ability to do those things that are becoming more complex or the things that we can treat are becoming more complex and the way that we can treat them is becoming smaller. So okay. um, one of my colleagues here uh, does a number of endoscopic procedures where um, we go from uh, we took surgery down to a half inch incision and now he can take it down to a couple millimeters of an incision. So, wow. um, so the things that we can sometimes do are pretty impressive depending upon uh, what we're treating. I think that's very impressive. Um, so we've got so we've got a question here that came in on our one of our preview posts from Tim Williams. I hope you're here, Tim. He says, "I have lumbar lumbar excuse me sacral spinal stenosis. Have received three rounds of injections that last six months each. He's not having any muscle weakness yet, but chronic pain. What are the next alternatives for someone like Tim?" Well, um, treatment for spinal stenosis, as with almost any spinal condition, really becomes a quality of life question. Yeah. Um, and so some, uh, for some patients, uh, six months of improvement with an injection is, is acceptable, and mm -hmm. um, that's a, an effective management strategy, and doing that serially over time um, is very reasonable, along with right. other treatment techniques like, again, physical therapy, regular exercise, and things of that nature. Um, Sometimes as, uh, as time progresses and as the underlying problems progress, those things can become less effective. Um, the time course of improvement can go from six months to six weeks and then not at all. And in those cases, that's where we may uh, shift focus to uh, the sur surgical arm of treatment. And uh, there are a number of different surgical procedures that can be done to very effectively and uh, successfully treat um, spinal stenosis depending upon the underlying cause because okay. although the symptoms may be the same there's a number of uh, different conditions that can uh, okay. present similarly. Okay good really good question Tim thank you for submitting that. So we've got one here and I'm not sure I, I'm not sure if you can answer this but I'm gonna ask and see what you, it says do you think extended cell phone use can affect your spine over time? 
Um, I think I've seen some debates about that. Well, I think there's um, there's more and more recognition of some, particularly with the cervical spine, mm -hmm. uh, some of the uh, the issues that arise from uh, being on computers a lot, right. um, being at a desk a lot, working on smartphones and tablets, um, and it really has to do with a strain uh, from poor bi uh, biomechanics of the neck. Okay. Um, so I don't think it's the cell phone in and of itself. It's more the uh, the positions that we're in I'll for prolonged right. periods of time uh, that can lead to muscle ache. And there's um, and a, a number of um, studies that have been uh, published here recently on um, I forget the exact uh, where kids uh, that are on tablets very for long periods of time they actually can have um, changes in the shape of the or the alignment of their neck. Oh, so no. um, so. Uh, Sitting at a desk and doing things that seem somewhat benign aren't always that aren't always the case. Yeah. So what do you do in cases like that? Is that a case where doing something like Pilates or mm -hmm. yoga could help realign? Well, I, I as I mentioned earlier, exercise and staying fit is always critical. Um, and as I tell my patients, moderation is not a bad word. So um, moderation is is always the key for things like that. Okay. So going to go back to spinal surgery a little bit. Yes, I mean, what common conditions can be treated with spinal surgery? Um, I'd say the most common things that we treat surgically are things like uh, lumbar herniated disc, uh, spinal stenosis is a very mm -hmm. common uh, mm -hmm. uh, condition that we treat, uh, spinal deformity such as scoliosis or spinal okay. um spinal trauma, spinal tumors. Um, there, the list goes on and on in terms of the things that we can treat, uh, even for some chronic conditions or chronic pain. Um, a number of my colleagues, we treat things with, uh, say, spinal cord stimulation, which is a, right. is a evolving technology that uh, it can help patients that have had refractory pain that's been um, unresponsive to the traditional uh, surgical techniques, right. or patients that have had multiple operations that continue to have pain. Uh, for, for some, that can provide a very, very significant improvement in their quality of life. So what about, let's see, let me go down this list here. They are asking about, here we go. What does a cervical disc replacement entail? This is from Lori. Good question, Lori. So a cervical disc replacement, um, basically what it is is usually to treat cervical radiculopathy or, or impingement of the spinal cord or nerve roots in the neck. Um, and instead of uh, fusing the spine, which mm -hmm. is, has been traditionally done because of what we have to do in order to treat it, okay. um, we put in an artificial disc. And the goal there is to maintain the motion um, and also try and avoid some of the long-term consequences of fusion. Mm -hmm. um, it's a technique, again, that has been rapidly evolving really over the past decade or so. It's, mm -hmm. there, there have been different permutations of it around much longer. Okay. Um, but really the past decade has really seen an explosion in really good devices that um, have been a very viable alternative to um, the traditional fusion approach there. Again, it's not right for everyone, but for patients that are uh, appropriate candidates for it, um, it can have the same efficacy of the, the traditional fusion, mm -hmm. but maintain motion and can have some benefits in the long run for, uh, for appropriate patients. I know motion is really important for a lot of people. Is, yeah. that, is that something that can be done minimally invasively or is that going to be a more extensive surgery? Um, it's a fairly small operation. I, I wouldn't necessarily categorize it as minimally invasive. Mm -hmm. um, because obviously in the neck there's a bunch of important things there, uh, blood vessels, spinal cord, and things like right. that. Um, so it's, it's, a, um, it's not as invasive as some of the procedures that we do. Mm -hmm. um, it's, a, it's a fairly small procedure to do it, um, but I, I wouldn't necessarily uh, categorize it in the minimally invasive arm okay. of, what we, of what we do. Okay, that's a really good question, Laurie. So we've got one here. Um, we talked, touched on this a little bit earlier, right. but how are spinal t tubers diagnosed? Um, so it, it depends on the history. So for patients that have a history, say, of breast cancer, um, often if they uh, come in with new onset back pain or neurologic symptoms, mm -hmm. MRI scans uh, pretty much the gold standard there. Um, obviously in the appropriate history, uh, as clinicians, we want to make sure that we um, the clinical symptoms fit with that being in the uh, in the differential diagnosis. Right. Um, also clinical examination findings can sometimes point to that. but. Uh, typically, MRI scan is the gold standard to okay. uh, to uh, diagnose tumors. Uh, CT scan in cases where we can't uh, where we can't get an MRI. Okay. Do you find that these spinal tumors are more prevalent in men or women? Um, it depends on the uh, on the source. So, mm -hmm. uh, and there are so many different types of spinal tumors right. um, that the answer, uh, depending on what you're looking at, 
is it can be male or female. Um, okay. If you look at um, metastatic tumors, for example, uh, that have spread from elsewhere, um, breast cancer is going to be a very large po uh, po proportion of that, which mm -hmm. obviously is more common in women. Mm -hmm. um, but lung cancer is also going to be a very common source of, um, of tumors that have spread to the spine. Okay. Um, so uh, that's going to be a little bit more prevalent in men. Right. Um, so it depends on the population that you're looking at. Okay, that, that's a that makes sense. So, what about are there any particular groups that are at higher risk, whether it's ethnicities mm -hmm. or, you know, we talked about men and women. Yes, ma'am. What does that look like? Um, I, I think um, those are that are at high risk are um, obviously smokers. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, I don't think there's been a health benefit discovered for smoking yet. Um, so, um, so smokers are at high risk um, because they're at high risk for cancer in general. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, there are a few genetic syndromes that okay. uh, that increases the risk for an individual, mm -hmm. uh, and those are, are usually very well known. Things like neurofibromatosis uh, is one of those. Right. Um, but the majority of uh, primary spinal tumors or tumors that arise in the spine first, mm -hmm. those are what we refer to as sporadic, meaning it's just there's no predisposing factors, it just okay. happens. Okay. So, you know, guys, we have about 10 minutes left. These have been some great questions. Keep them coming. We know we always get a flood at the end, so go ahead and put those in now so we can make sure to address them. So a question that, that I had that I wanted to find out, are there any unique factors that athletes should take into account when thinking about their spine? Well, I, I think for for the athlete, they're uh, particularly a tough uh, group of individuals because mm -hmm. um, athletes view themselves often as indestructible. It's about pushing your body uh, beyond what you think you can do. Yeah. Um, and especially the younger athletes um, mm -hmm. in high school age or uh, in their early 20s, um, you're indestructible, nothing hurts. You, you know, right. you, you have an injury and you just rub some dirt on and you keep moving. <laughs> Um, however, uh, understanding that keeping your body healthy really starts at that age because otherwise the, the consequences when you're in your 40s or 50s uh, can be significant. Um, so um, again, moderation is, is always a good thing. Um, we see a lot of kids now that play sports essentially year round and so the repetitive use injuries that we see in kids um, used to be something that we only saw in adults and we're seeing that in baseball pitchers uh, in high school age now. We're with seeing that shoulders. with shoulders and, uh, and elbows uh, that are wearing out um, because they're playing the sport year round nonstop. Um, so again, I think it's about moderation and, and remembering that, um, you know, again, although at that time, uh, there's, there's no uh, at least perceivable consequence to it, but in the long run, there, there often is. Okay, so is there a certain age at when when your your spine is what is it at its prime? So this is the best your spine is going to be. <laughs> well, I, I think when we look at spines and folks in their twenties, it's usually very very healthy. Right. You start seeing some early signs of deterioration in in general when folks start to get into their thirties. Okay. Um, you can sometimes see it earlier, especially in folks that have been uh, that have been athletes their entire life. Mm -hmm. um, we see some degenerative changes that are a bit more advanced um, in the in their twenties, especially those that have a bit more of a genetic susceptibility. So they have a family history mm -hmm. of uh, spinal problems back problems and things like that okay um, so they may they may show signs of that advanced wear and tear at an earlier age okay so when is the typical age I mean what are when should somebody come see you at what point well I think um, me as a neurosurgeon I, I, I think the vast majority of folks fortunately don't need me and I, yeah. I think that's a that's a very good thing um, however, seeking care from a group like ours, I think mm -hmm. when the symptoms have been uh, refractory to routine treatment, again, activity modification, not um, you know bed rest, because uh, right. we don't really recommend that anymore, uh, prolonged periods of bed rest for, uh, for back problems. Um, when it's not responsive to over-the-counter medications and it has um, become a significant hindrance of one's quality of life. Um, I think that's the other uh, point, because if you're able to do all the things that you want to do, um, then it's probably not much that we're going to uh, to do to alter that because you're okay. you're already at your um, your desired level of activity and desired level of quality of life. Okay. All right. So really focus on when it starts to affect your quality of life. Then mm -hmm. that's a good time to reach out to a spine center mm -hmm. like this one, or if you're not here, something closer. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. That makes that makes perfect sense. So what other? Let me see. Gotta check these last questions. So just a reminder, we've got five minutes left. We are running out of time with Dr. Bagley. Let's see. 
All right, let's go back to, where did it go? All right, just some general tips for spine care. So I know we've talked about this a lot, but it yes, keeps coming up. So what we're talking about is healthy weight, yes, exercise, mm -hmm. and what were the other ones? Um, moderation with activity. Um, mm -hmm. Things, uh, a common scenario that we will often see are folks that, um, let's say uh, you've retired, and now you got all this time on your hand and you're a golfer. Um, <laughs> right. During your work career, you, pay, you played golf once a month, once uh -huh. a weekend. Um, now you're retired, so you're gonna play golf every day. Um, that's probably not gonna go over well. And so okay. moderation, again, is, is, uh, is the key there. Okay. Um, and also making sure that, uh, that you prepare your body, you stretch, you warm up, okay. uh, things of that nature, and you stay active. You, you find an exercise and activity program that works for you. Mm -hmm. um, as you get older, non-impact things are gonna be better, so swimming, cycling, things that, like okay. that where there's not the jarring on the joints. Um, but staying active, staying moving, okay. core strengthening, those are, are going to be very important to keeping you um, away from needing folks like me. <laughs> so maybe then, sounds like you want to possibly stay away from that tackle football, maybe limit, maybe <laughs> limit or be careful about golf. I mean, are there certain sports that people are more prone to having back challenges? Um, no. It, uh, Fortunately, uh, back pain knows it, it knows no boundaries. Uh, it uh, it's really uh, prevalent in all fields. Um, golf is a very common group of uh, individuals because of the torque on the spine, okay. um, and often uh, golf is seen as a social thing. And so it's not you know when folks are out playing golf, they don't think of warming up, they don't think of stretching, they right. don't think of good uh, mechanics of when they're they're uh, they're swinging a golf club, mm -hmm. um, which can be uh, pretty debilitating. So it doesn't have to be football; uh, it can be basketball, lacrosse, other you know other sports, tennis, okay. um, things that where you're running on a hard surface all the time. Mm -hmm. um, those any sport can really uh, impact the back um, so being mindful of that uh, taking care of your body warming up before okay um, and uh, things like that okay that's all really good feedback yes ma'am so I think let's see what time I think we are running close to time you know I think we've got time for one more question and this would be hold on I'm gonna pick one out here Let's see, so here we go. This one is from, from Greg. Greg says, has TDR proven to be advantageous versus fusion in the cervical spine? It's a really good question. Um, it, it, it has in certain populations. So it is an area that's somewhat controversial. It mm -hmm. hasn't been, um, I would say, it hasn't been uh, indisputably shown to be superior. Okay. Um, it's been shown definitely to be as effective. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there are definitely certain populations of patients that um, it is a better treatment for and so With something like that. There's no one right answer. It really okay. depends on the individual and everything There's a risk-benefit ratio um, for example uh, with cervical fusion we've we've that technique has been around for a long time mm -hmm. it's a known so we know what the long-term consequences of that both good and bad right. um, with cervical disc replacement that technology hasn't been around very long so we don't have 20 year 30 year follow-up data okay. and so that's an unknown and so there's always a risk reward ratio with any new technology so as we're advancing the field we're we're gaining knowledge and mm -hmm. we're learning um, the good and bad of everything mm -hmm. um, but it is a, a very very uh, viable option okay that's a that's a great question Greg so we go one more this is the last one this one is you talked about you know care that you want to do before you start working out to protect your spine what about after working mm -hmm. out is that as an as important or can you just finish golf and just go on your way well I think the cool down is also just as, as important as the warm-up mm -hmm. um, again the bookend on both ends of, of the sport act, the sporting activity is very important um, because again, that's maintained. That's good maintenance for your body. Mm -hmm. um, just uh, with most things, if you, for example, if you're in the dead of sleep and someone gets you up and tells you to just all of a sudden now start running a mile and then go back and lay down, it's probably not going to go over well. And so again, kind of the yeah. warm up, the cool down, um, just like any other um, uh, mechanical device, which uh, we uh, have, are fortunate to have one of the most uh, complicated mechanical devices ever designed, uh, being yeah. the human body. Um, and so we have to take care of it. Okay, 
I think that's a great that's a great place to end our chat. This has been really great. I want to thank everybody for all of the questions. We are right at 3.30, so we're going to let Dr. Bagley get back to his day. But thank you very much for tuning in today. We appreciate all the questions and feedback and hope that everybody has a great weekend. Thank you very much. Thank you.